Good morning. My name is Rod Libby. I'm Quality Assurance Director with the Workers' Compensation Insurance Rating Bureau. Joining me today is Angela Sundin, uh, Operations Analyst from Member Services, and this is our WCRB Mod Talk series. Today we're going to be talking about how to read a rate sheet. Um, the Mod Talk series uh, is generally a 30 to 45 minute webinar where we discuss topics related to experience rating. Uh, today what we're going to talk about is kind of the four sections of the rate sheet. We'll talk about annotations, footnotes, and their meanings, provide oversight on the understanding of re-rates and why, re why rate sheets are revisited. If you have any questions as we proceed, um, please type those questions within the uh, questions bar. Uh, we will try to answer those either during the webinar or after the webinar. If we don't get to the questions that you have or you have some questions after, uh, you can send your questions to communications at wcirb.com. There is a PDF handout within it for this webinar in the handout panel. And lastly, I guess, um, we will be, or are recording this webinar. It will be posted this afternoon on wcirb.com slash webinars. So let's start off by kind of doing a brief overview of experience rating. So experience rating is a state mandated merit rating system. It's something that's codified within the California Insurance Code. And it benchmarks an employer against others within their industry. The experience modification is expressed as a percentage with an experience modification of less than 100%, meaning an employer is doing better on average than the loss history of their industry. Uh, if you have an experience modification over 100%, it means that that employer has a worse loss history than what's average for their industry. We at the WCRB Rating Bureau, we're the organization that publishes these experience modifications. Um, we, the communication of those experience modifications is made through the workers' compensation experience rating form. We refer to it as the rate sheet, which shows the experience, how the experience modification was derived. It's going to reflect the payroll and loss experience for each policy that falls within the three-year experience period. And it will include the payroll by classification and list the individual claim amounts, aggregating the medical and indemnity values for each of the claims. The rate sheet also includes the approved rating values used to calculate the experience modification for the specific year. So let's get into it and let's start talking about the experience rating form. And now I'll turn it over to Angela. Hi, this is Angela. Um, so let's go over the four sections of a rate sheet, uh, the first of which is the header. So each rate sheet is released to a specific carrier. Um, a carrier that covers a specific policy. Um, what you'll see on the top left is the policyholder information for the specific policy. Uh, that will include uh, the mailing address as well as the primary name on the policy. And then we list a couple additional entity names uh, on the rate sheet as well. Uh, if you look at the lower left, you'll see the bureau assigned class codes. These class codes are the class codes that are assigned from an inspection report. Um, if a risk hasn't actually undergone an inspection, uh, there won't be any assigned class codes uh, in this portion of the header. Um, on the right side, you'll see a couple uh, different pieces of information um, about the mod, uh, including the effective date, the issue date, what the actual XMOD percentage is, um, and then you will also see information about the insurer for this specific policy. Um, at the bottom, you'll also see the experience period. Um, and that'll indicate which policies USRs are being included in this particular MODS calculation. Uh, the second section is the expected losses. That's on the left side. 
there will be a separate section for each policy, uh, policies USR that's being included uh, in this particular mod calculation. Uh, first column lists all the class codes uh, that are reported on the USR. Second would be the payroll that's being reported. Um, the payroll is going to be total at the bottom of the expected losses section. Again, this is uh, a, just a shot of each individual policy's USR that's being included in the mod calculation. Uh, the expected loss rate comes from an expected uh, loss uh, worksheet uh, by class code. Um, and then we calculate the expected losses by uh, multiplying the payroll by the expected loss rate and dividing by 100. Um, the D-ratio comes from a D-ratio worksheet, uh, again by classification code. Um, and then we multiply the D-ratio by the expected losses to get the expected primary losses. Um, and then the difference between the expected losses and the expected primary losses are the expected excess losses. On the right side, we'll see the actual losses section. Uh, this information is coming from claims that have been reported on the USRs. Uh, you'll see the claim number, the injury type, whether the claim is open or closed. Um, and then you'll see the actual losses and the actual primary losses. The difference between these two is that uh, the actual uh, primary losses do not include the first $250 uh, of the claim. Um, if you look at the second line, the actual losses there is 79, so the actual primary losses is zero because 79 is not greater than 250. Um, the primary threshold at the top right uh, comes from a primary threshold worksheet, again, by classification code. And at the bottom, we have the rating procedure section. Um, this actually shows the calculation for the experience modification. Uh, we include the actual primary losses, the expected excess losses, as well as the expected losses in the calculation. You can see here that the X mod is 76%. Um, below that, you'll see the loss-free rating, which is the experience modification that would have applied to this risk if the risk had no claims during the experience period. Um, there's some information on our website in the Learning Center. Um, specifically a copy of this type of rate sheet um, and, and uh, there's a, a little uh, a quick video to show how to kind of walk through that rate sheet. Um, there is some other information on the website that's helpful as well like the class search tool. Um, but let's take a look at uh, where to find this information on our website. I guess the video is not working at the moment, <laughs> um, but I suggest that you go to the WCIOB Learning Center um, and look at the Experience Modification section and you'll see um, a copy of a rate sheet and links to click that explain what each portion of the rate sheet uh, is for. Um, along with the information in the rate sheet that we've gone over, there are also annotations and footnotes um, in the rate sheet that kind of describe uh, s sort of special circumstances. Uh, we use four different annotations in the rate sheet. Um, the first one is uh, to include self-insured data. So for this data, the policy information um, or the USR information will be on the rate sheet, um, but uh, there won't be any sort of indication that it was self-insured, so we actually put an annotation in the rate sheet to note that. Um, if we do receive estimated payroll for a USR, uh, we don't include that into the mod calculation, but we do include the losses. Um, so if you see a rate sheet and there is a section that has no payroll but there is corresponding losses, um, it's typically because the uh, payroll for that USR was estimated, so we would have excluded it from the uh, mod calculation. Uh, the third situation would be for insolvent insurer data. Um, specifically, if the date of insolvency for this insurer is prior to the valuation date of the USR, uh, that data will not be included in the, in the rating calculation. So if you're expecting to see maybe three policies um, and you only see two, that could be a reason why. And the last annotation is uh, if there is a limitation on the XMOD percentage, um, you'll see that. Um, that's typically only when there's one claim reported during the experience period. We limit the amount that the mod can increase to a maximum of 25%. Um, if the mod would have increased, 
increase less than that, then um, there would be no limitation there. Um, keep note that the annotations are only shown on the rate sheet. They are not shown on the XMOD history displayed in WCIRB Connect. Um, so uh, if there's anything on the XMOD history that seems like it doesn't make sense, uh, we recommend that you go and look at the rate sheet and see if there's any annotations or footnotes. Um, the annotations that are used for each of these four different situations are listed here. And if you do see a limited experience modification, um, you'll see the annotation of L um, in the header uh, next to the XMOD percentage, as well as in the bottom uh, with the rating procedure. You'll see it next to the experience modification. The annotation is there. Um, and then you will see a footnote below that. Um, here you can see that it says it was limited to 25% points. And we actually provide the unlimited experience modification. In this case, it would have been 109%, but we've limited it to 103, again, because there was only one claim that fell into the experience period. Um, the footnotes kind of correspond um, sometimes to the annotations, but there are also times where we have footnotes that um, do not correspond to annotations. A couple different situations. Um, the first one would be um, if there is a catastrophe claim. Um, those are going to be grouped together in the claims section. Um, another situation would be if there's a change in ownership. Uh, we would typically share some experience from a different risk uh, to this risk, and you know, we would denote it with a footnote on the rate sheet. Um, and the last situation would be if we're reassigning payroll from one class to another class code. Um, sometimes this is as a result of a WCIRB inspection uh, or a test audit that includes an inspection. Or if we're establishing a new classification code that wasn't available at the time the policy was originally underwritten. Um, so those would be new class codes. Or if we've sort of retired a class code and it's no longer in use, but we're reassigning the class uh, the payroll to um, a different class code, uh, you would see that on there as well um, as part of the footnote. And again, the footnotes are going to be reflected on the rate sheet and not on the XMOD history display in WCIRB Connect. Um, for catastrophe claims, what you'll see um, in the uh, actual losses section, um, the individual claims will be denoted with a C. Uh, we do include the individual claim information, um, but we will uh, aggregate it together into one line at the bottom um, typically denoted with a CAT for catastrophe, again with a, a C. Um, in this particular scenario, the catastrophe claim has been limited to a maximum of 350000 for actual losses and 14000 for the uh, primary actual losses. Not all catastrophe claims are limited, but in this scenario, it is. Again, the individual claim values are not included in the experience modification. It'll just be the total catastrophe claim value as seen um, below the individual claims. If there are multiple catastrophe claims, you'll see those grouped together um, in, in separate groupings in the claims section. Um, if there is a classification reassignment, so we're reassigning payroll from one class code to another, um, you'll see that class code in the header. In this case, it was 8870, which is a new classification code that the WCIRB instituted. Um, and then you'll see that class code also appear in the expected losses section. Um, you won't see the old class code or the prior class code um, until you look at the bottom of the footnote. In this case, it does tell you that the data was reported um, under 8868 initially, but has been reassigned to 8870. Um, so you'll see that in the footnotes. And now here's Rod. Thank you. So um, now we want to talk a little bit about instances in which an original rating um, is going to be subsequently revised. So the, the reasons why we would re-rate an experience modification relate to an error in the original calculation. So if something happened when the mod was originally calculated, claims got duplicated, or something happened where the calculation was incorrect. Um, there are other instances include situations where the insurer has reported changes to the payroll values on uh, a unit statistical report that fell within the experience period. They could have changed the claim values. 
um, or there was a change in ownership that resulted in a combination or decombination of entities. So payroll and losses are being included or excluded from a previously calculated experience modification. Or lastly, the aggregated values of closed claims is less than 60% of the aggregate of the highest value at which each claim was previously used in the rating. So this situation of closed claim re-rates occurs when we have subsequent report levels and the original claim values have now been, that were open are now closed and those lower closed claim values meet this uh, threshold of less than 60%. So re-rates are only going to occur or we're going to only issue a revised experience modification if the values used in the calculation change. So let's say that you had a claim that was reported initially that had an incurred value of $100,000 and uh, that was wrong. It actually should have been reported as $50,000. So when we get a reported correction to the unit statistical report that changes that incurred value to $50,000, it isn't necessarily going to automatically trigger a re-rate if that claim value remains above the primary threshold for the policyholder. So if I'm only using the first $15,000 of the claim, the fact that the incurred value went from $100,000 to $50,000 would not change the actual experience modification calculation. So there would be no re-rate that would be issued. Um, each re-rate, so if we are in fact going to reissue a mod and we're going to re-rate that mod, it's going to contain a re-rate number sequence. Uh, the reason for the re-rate will be displayed within the header section of the rate sheet. If there is more than one reason, um, they, those reasons will be displayed in the header section and then there will be or should be corresponding footnotes that should be reflected in the bottom that kind of explain why it is that we were re-rating the experience modification. Um, the re-rate will also include within the header section the rating that it replaces or supersedes. And um, so let's take a look at an example. So in this example, we have um, an experience modification that has been re-rated. You see um, in the header section that this is re-rate number two, which means that there has already been, there was an initial rating, there was a re-rate of that initial rating, and now we're on the second revision of the experience modification. The reason for the re-rate was an exposure correction. And you see that there's a little number one after exposure correction. Once you see a number by that re-rate reason in the header, that's going to tell you that there's going to be a corresponding footnote that is going to explain um, why that or what, what that exposure correction is really about. So then down in the footnote section underneath the, the um, footer section, you're going to see that the re-rate was a result of an exposure correction for the years of 2017. So here's a listing of the various re-rate reasons that you're going to see in the header. So you're going to see instances where there's a combine, where we've combined the experience of entities as a result of an ownership evaluation and determination. Uh, this is going to be instances where you're going to see that the previous rating is changed to include additional experience from policies that have been combined or moved into this bureau number. A decombine is going to kind of be the reverse. So this is going to be where we're separating entities that were previously combined in a rating. So you're going to see in this re-rated experience modification that you're going to have less policy experience that's going to be used in the calculation. Um, exposure corrections, this is going to be where payroll has been corrected by the insurer and reported on a unit statistical report. Loss correction, again, would be instances where the insurer has changed the value of the claims that were used or reported on the unit statistical report for a policy that fell within the experience period. A non-compensable claim would be a situation where the claim was reported by the insurer as being non-compensable, and so the claim, that claim value is going to be removed from the calculation. Subrogation claim would be a situation where a claim was reported as 
subrogated for the first time. And so the mod would be revised to reflect those new values. Joint coverage claim, again, the first time a claim would be reported as a joint coverage claim by the insurer on a unit statistical report would facilitate uh, amending the experience modification. Closed compromised death, a claim, a death claim that it was closed and compromised solely over whether or not the injured worker was due benefits within the workers' compensation system. And we have reassigned class codes. This would be instances where we have reassigned the classifications that were originally reported by the insurer on the unit statistical report as a result of an inspection or a test audit. Revised losses would be situations where new claims or loss values were reported by the insurer on an unanticipated subsequent report. So when we go to calculate the initial experience modification, um, all of the claims have been reported as closed, for instance, at the second report level. So we're not expecting to receive a third report level. When So I issue the experience modification because we think that we have all the experience that is going to be required to be used in the calculation of the experience modification. And then subsequent, after we issue the modification, we get a third report level and either those closed claim values have changed or there's a new late reported claim that comes in. So we want to reissue the mod using those new values. And so we would, issue, again, issue a re-rate with the heading of revised losses. And the last is closed claim re-rate. Again, this is instances that I talked a little bit about before where we've got a claims are closing at subsequent report levels and the aggregated values of those claims is less than 60% for all of the closed claims from what was previously used in a rating. Uh, for closed claim re-rates, we are, this is an instance where we're going to use a subsequent report level values to calculate the experience modification. So rather than using first, second, and third report levels, we're going to use second, third, and fourth um, values. And so it's important that um, insurers be aware of this um, re-rate reason uh, because we're going to be using different report level values. So the re-rate reasons are, in, again, in the header section, and then there's going to be corresponding footnotes associated with these. Um, combine and decombine, again, it's just indicating that we're either combining or separating. When we have exposure corrections or loss corrections, we're going to denote the year that those corrections were um, in well, the policy years that those are impacting. Um, we're not going to tell you specifically which policy it is that has re been revised. You're going to have to really take a look at the preceding issued experience modification to compare it to the re-rated experience modification to figure out exactly what claims have, have been revised. Similar to non-compensable, subrogated, and joint coverage claims, um, as well as comp, uh, co closed compromised death claims, we're going to specify what policy years it is that um, we receive those amendments to those claim values. Reassign class codes, you're going to see the class code that was originally reported and what it was reassigned to. Again, revised losses is going to tell you what year it is that we received an unexpected claim values for a particular policy year, and then the closed claim re-rate basically references the experience rating plan provisions for closed claim re-rates. So let's take a look at a couple examples here. So in this case, we have a re-rate. Um, this is re-rate number one. There are two reasons for the re-rate. So we've got a loss correction, and we've got a subrogated claim. And then you've got a little one by loss correction. If you go down to the footnote, you see that the number one, the re-rate, was due to loss correction for years 2014. And then for the subrogation, there's a number two. If you go down to the footnote, you see that the re-rate for the subrogation was due to claims in policy year 2013. For closed claim re-rates, 
Here's an example. So again, you're going to, you have free rate number one. Right next to that, you have closed claim values. Again, that's telling you that we are not using the normal first, second, and third report level. We're advancing the report levels to the next subsequent report level values. And then the re-rate reason is that it was a closed claim re-rate. Um, for closed claim re-rates, if in fact there's a revision to a closed claim re-rate because of a subrogation or um, a, a non-compensable claim or things like that, you're gonna, it's going to continue to identify that closed claim values who are going to be used. So in the re-rate number, you're going to have a new re-rate number, but it's still going to say closed claim values so that you're aware that we're using uh, not normally associated um, report level values. There are instances where when we're issuing re-rates, those re-rates are not going to be effective as of the original issue date, but rather there's going to be a midterm effective date associated with those. Uh, those instances would be two. One would be instances where there has been a change in ownership. So we're either combining or decombining experience due to a change in ownership that occurred sometime midterm within that experience modification effective period. So if an employer buys a business on July 1st and their anniversary date is running January 1st, I want to revise their January 1st experience modification on July 1st to reflect that a new experience of the entity that they've acquired. So in, in those instances, the effective date is going to have two little asterisks by it that's going to, that is going to be the communication to indicate that the effective date of this experience modification is different than the established rating date. Um, the original rating effective date will be referenced in a footnote, or if you're really good, um, you can take a look at the experience period and you can figure out what the um, original rating effective date is um, by recognizing that that experience period corresponds to a period that's four years and nine months and one year and nine months from the effective date of that rating. The other instances is going to be instant is going to be situations where we have revised the experience modification and that revision results in an increased experience modification and that increase has occurred more than three months from the effective date or the publication date of the original experience modification. So the experience rating plan directs that in these instances where the mod is going to be uh, higher, it's going to be effective the date that it's going to be published rather than going back to the original effective date. So let's take a look at a couple examples here. So here we have experience modifications with a midterm effective date that is a result of a combine. So up in the header section, you're going to see that the effective date has two asterisks by it. And then down at the bottom portion of the rate sheet, if you guys can see it, it's kind of small, so you may have to take my word for it, but it, it has the two asterisks on the bottom and it says that it's re-rated XMOD effective 9-1-2017 per the experience rating plan where it's about changes in status and combination of entities. Another example of a midterm effective date is going to be a situation where the mod has increased. So again, I have two asterisks up on the effective date of February 16th, 2019. Um, this re-rate was a, due to a loss correction. You can see under the re-rate reason. And then when you go down to the footnote, you'll see the annotation or the two asterisks that say re-rate mod effective August 10th, 2018 for the experience rating plan section five rule six, um, which again is indicating that this experience modification has now increased. So in this particular situation, as with the combine, you're gonna have an exp one experience modification. For this case, you're gonna have a one experience modification that's gonna apply from August 10th, 2018 to February 16th, 2019. And then you're going to have a different mod, in this case, 116% experience modification that would apply from February 16th 
2019 to the end of the effective period. So let's talk a little bit. There are some instances where we're going to reissue rate sheets. Um, generally, there's going to be two situations where we're going to reissue a rate sheet. So we're not, when we're talking reissuing, we're not re-rating. So there's no changes in the underlying data or how the data was utilized in the calculation. I just want to reissue it because there's something on this rate sheet that I want to change. So one of those situations would be to revise the policyholder name. So as Angela talked about up in the header section, we're going to be pulling the names from the policy. And there's instances where there may be multiple names that are reflected on the policy. And the one name that's utilized within California may be the 20th name, and it may not be reflected on the rate sheet, and the policyholder or broker or insurer would like us to reissue that rate sheet to reflect that particular name as one of the names on the rate sheet, again, we can do that. We can't just add a name. So if you want, if you want the name to come out as you know Chuck's Bar and Grill, and that's not one of the named insureds, we're not going to be able to do that. So we can only select names that are part of the policy, but we can amend or reissue the experience modification worksheet to reflect the policyholder names that would be um, advantageous to the policyholder. Uh, the other instance is where we change the effective period of the experience modification. Uh, we refer to this as correcting the unexpired term date. So for experience modification, if the mod is going to apply for a period of time that's less than one year, we put an expiration date on the rate sheet. So there's going to be instances where we have issued a rate sheet that we say applies for a period of time of less than a year, and ultimately policies change or the rating dates change, and now I want to remove that short-term expiration date. We would reissue the modification and putting a notation on that rate sheet that says we remove the expiration date. So it's going to, again, in the header, you're going to see that this is reissued for an unexpired term date. You're not going to see an expiration date on the header anymore, and then you're going to have this notation that we've removed the expiration date. If we're, if the mod was previously issued that applied for a year's period of time and now the rating dates have changed such that now I need to make this experience modification effective for less than one year and I want to add an expiration date. Again, I would reissue that mod. I'm going to add that expiration date and there's going to be a footnote that says that I've added an expiration date that's less than one year from the effective date. The third situation is going to be a situation where it was originally issued with a short-term date, and that date needs to change. So it may have expired on September 1st, and now we want it to change to expire on October 1st. So I'm going to, again, reissue that modification. I'm going to change the short-term expiration date, and so we're going to denote that by the term revised expiration date. The last thing that we do occasionally is we're going to have to withdraw an experience modification. Um, that withdraw could be this, that, own, that one specific re-rate. It could be that we are going to withdraw the mods in their entirety. And so in the instance where we're going to withdraw a mod, we're going to reissue the rate sheet as it looked when it was originally issued, and we're going to include a notation in there that the rate sheet has been withdrawn. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of what we're what we have just been talking about. So in this case, as you can see up in the header portion under the effective date, we have a mod that that applies from March 28, 2019, and it expires or applies to December 27, 2019. You can see that it was reissued to correct and says, so we're going to correct to unexpired term date. And the when you go down to the footnote, it says reissued to revise the effective mod, revise the expiration date. So we have, um, so in this particular instance, we have revised the, the expiration date of the a mod, so previously this experience modification would have applied for a year's period of time, and so we've added a new expiration date of December 27, 2019, implying that 
we are going to produce a, our next experience modification is going to be on December 27th, 2019. And then here is an example of a withdrawn rate sheet. So again, it looks, it, it, all of the data in this, so the header data, the payroll and loss data, the calculation, the mod percentage, the insurer, even the, the, um, the experience period and everything else, and the issue date is all going to be exactly the same as what was initially sent out. And what we've included is this withdrawn and put in the date that we've withdrawn it. So this mod was originally issued on June 8th of 2018, and it was subsequently withdrawn on July 2nd of 2018. Okay, so that kind of wraps up our um, talk today on uh, understanding and kind of navigating the rate sheet. Uh, we are going to have two additional uh, XMOD talks, one in August where we're going to talk about how to access the XMOD and all the various ways you can access that data associated with it. We'll also give a preview of the 2020 um, XMOD estimator at that time, and then in October we'll talk about why did the XMOD change, which again is always a big topic. So, do we have, let's see whether we've got some questions. Sure. So um, one of the questions that I see is, so on withdrawn, uh, yeah, so we just talked a little bit about withdrawn rate sheets. And so is there a reason um, why we are withdrawing the experience modification? And the answer is yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's always a reason. Um, but that reason is not communicated on the rate sheet. It's just, it's just withdrawn. So um, if there is a question, why it is that that experience modification was withdrawn, um, uh, the insurer or policyholder or broker could always contact our um, office, our contact center, and ask for an explanation for what was going on. Um, again, many times the experience modification was determined to be issued in air, that there may have been subsequent changes in the data that was reported. And so rather than reissuing the experience modification or re-rating, I should say, the experience modification again, I'm just going to re withdraw a re-rate that was previously issued because those values of those claims were inaccurate or the exposure was inaccurate. Um, we could be withdrawing the experience modification because, um, say, the rating date was set up inaccurately. So I need to withdraw that mod. I'm going to establish a new um, rating date for the experience modification. Um, for, so, so there are instances where um, experience modifications get re-rated or get revised and there is no footnote explanation that is contained within it. That What that means is the system uh, wasn't able to recognize the source of the change. Um, and so someone um, within the rating bureau uh, recognized or, what, or there was a question or a request to have an experience modification taken a look at and we've decided that yes, there was a loss correction for one reason or another. The system didn't automatically trigger the issuance of the revised experience modification, but we want to do that. So there are going to be instances you're still going to see in the header portion that this was revised because of an exposure correction or loss correction, but you're not going to see the specific year. And like I said before, there are, we're not going to tell you which claim was revised. You're going to have to actually take a look at the rate sheet um, and, 
and um, it to figure out which claim it was that was actually revised. Okay, we've got um, we got a few more questions, but we are kind of running out of time here. And again, I don't want to. I don't want to, we, we kind of set these up to run a particular period of time, and I don't want to inordinately delay people um, or have them hanging around for the rest of the day. Um, let me see whether I can get one more question here. Uh, so, so we got a question about estimated payrolls. Uh, again, we, we talked a little bit about um, instances where uh, the insurer has not cooperated with the audit. Uh, in those instances, we send a letter to the policyholder letting them know that we will be calculating the experience modification, excluding that estimated payroll, and they have 60 days in order to comply with the audit and work with their insurer in order to get audited payroll figures. In those instances where we are not able to get audited payroll figures within that 60-day period of time. Again, we are going to go ahead, produce the experience modification, uh, excluding the payroll but including any losses, and we will then have again that annotation that would have an that would have the U by the um, uh, or an E by the um, experience modification indicating that it was estimated. That modification, again, is subject to revision. So if the policyholder does cooperate with the audit, we would then issue a revised experience modification that should reflect that we had an exposure correction for that particular year. So again, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in August again when we have our next expo talk where we'll talk about how or the various sources where you can ac access your experience modifications. Thank you again.